This is DJ. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the RC Retirement uh, YouTube channel. This week I'm going to cover the Survivor Benefit Plan. Like its sister, the Reserve Component Survivor Benefit Plan, this is another critical decision that service members need to make. I'm going to repeat some of the stuff that I said last week because there are a lot of similarities between the two plans and it makes this episode a standalone episode that you can watch or listen to without having to watch the other one in order to understand what I'm saying. So let's, let's dig in. Because of some complexity, which I'll try to simplify, this will probably be a bit longer of an episode than what you've seen in the past. It won't be as long as last week, but it could still be you know, several minutes. The terms I use, again, will be based on my experience as a, an Army Retirement Service Officer, but the information itself will apply to all branches of service. And that's enough for the prologue. Let's dive right in. Again, this is in Q&A format, so that hopefully will make it a bit more understandable. Here we go. What is the Survivor Benefit Plan? As I said in my episode about the reserve component version of the plan, retired pay stops with the death of the retiree. There is no way to pass on your retirement to a family member or anyone else through a will or any other sort of legal document. The Survivor Benefit Plan, or SBP, is the only way a person receiving retired pay can pass on any sort of survivor annuity to a family member. Notice that I said annuity rather than retired pay or pension. This is not your retirement. This is something that you are purchasing in order to leave it to a survivor as an additional form of income for them. So when do you make this critical decision? That's quite simple. Make this election when you apply for your retirement. And by that I mean retired pay. So if you're 40 years old and going into the retired reserve, you're not applying for true retirement yet. You're just going into essentially a holding pattern until you're 60. Then you apply for retired pay. That's when you make a survivor benefit election on the essentially the active duty side. You've already made one for the reserve component, now you make another one to cover you from age 60 and beyond. What happens if I don't make an election? Well, if the Defense Finance and Accounting Service, or DFAS, has nothing that indicates that you are actually single, if they have reason to think you're married, then they're going to make an election for you and start charging you premiums based on that. Now, if you are actually single, you'll need to contact a retirement services officer or call DFAS directly in order to get that squared away. Okay, so maybe I've convinced you. How much will this pay your beneficiaries, you might be wondering? Well, SBP is based on your retired pay, so Obviously, the higher your pay, the more the survivor annuity would be. It pays 55% of whatever you set up as what's called a base amount. And the base amount can be anywhere from $300, which is the lowest it can be, up to the full amount of your retired pay. This means if you select the lowest amount, $300, then the survivor annuity will be 55% of that, or $165. I know listening to stuff with a bunch of numbers can be difficult. If it's just a video or audio, please try to bear with me. I'll keep it as simple as I can. Let's say you elect a higher amount of pay, your full retirement. And in this example, let's say it's $1,000 per month. 55% of that would be $550, and that's the survivor annuity that you would pass on. 
all right there's always a cost so what will this cost me all right it, unlike the reserve component SPP it's a lot harder correction it's a lot easier to give an example of what cost will be so the cost can be very low in some cases a dollar or two if you're covering just a child it can be as high as 40 percent if you make certain very rare elections but usually for a spouse it's extremely unlikely that the cost will ever be higher than six and a half percent of your retired pay. Keep in mind, if you elected coverage under the reserve component survivor benefit plan as well, then you'll pay both premiums. So six and a half percent under the 60 and over plan and up to three and a half percent from the reserve component plan. So in the worst case, and I do mean worst, I've, I've seen a lot of these and the highest premium I've ever seen was 10% of retired pay. Now when you consider that the survivor annuity is 55% of your pay, you can see how very quickly this becomes a quite good, a very nice return on investment. It doesn't take long for you to get, or rather for your survivor to get, more money in survivor annuity than you ever paid in premiums. The longest I've ever seen is five years. And obviously that's different for each individual, but it doesn't take long at all for the survivor to get more money than you ever paid yourself. There's another upside to this cost. You don't pay for SBP out of your pocket until you start to receive your retired pay. And even then, it's directly debited from your pay and it comes out before taxes are computed. So you actually save some money in tax withholding there. Now, let me, let me give you another example here. Let's see how this actually works. I'll use an actual retiree here. And he's where I got a lot of the numbers I've thrown out so far and I'll get even more specific here in this case he actually had an even $1,000 per month in retired pay he selected his wife as a beneficiary she was one year younger than he was in his case his reserve component premium was about $42.78 per month which is 3.04% of his retired pay. His survivor benefit premium, the 60 and over plan, came out to, I gave you a mistake there. His reserve component premium was $30.40 per month, which was 3.04% of his pay. His 60 and over SBP premium was $42.78. Add these together and his combined survivor benefit premium was $73.18 per month. That came out to 7.32% of his retired pay. Or if you want to get really, really specific, 7.318%, but who's counting, right? All right. This all came out of his retirement automatically. If he dies, his wife will receive $550 per month as a survivor annuity, and she will not pay anything for it herself. There will be taxes, of course, but she will not be liable for any of the premiums that he was paying. That ends with him. I'm not going to go into applying for the survivor annuity. That will be a topic for another show. So you might be saying, that still sounds like a lot of money to me. Wouldn't it be a better deal if I got a life insurance policy instead? I mean, my gosh, servicemen's group life insurance is only $29 per month, right? And that's true. The premium for survivor correction for SGLI is very low, but you cannot take that with you when you leave the service you do have the option to convert to what's called veterans group life insurance, but that is incredibly expensive 
and the cost goes up every five years. For example, if you're 60 years old and you want $400,000 in coverage from VGLI, that will cost $432 per month. If you're 75 years old with that level of coverage, it will cost over $1,800 per month. Even civilian life insurance policies, while they have much lower premiums than VGLI would, many times can be higher than the SBP premiums. Our SBP is a pretty good deal. Of course, everyone's situation is different. I can't just make a blanket comment that you absolutely should select SBP in your case. You need to study your own circumstances and make a decision yourself. But to help with that, let me describe a comparison between this particular individual's life insurance policy and the survivor annuity. If he were to die this year, he would be leaving $550 per month in a survivor annuity. Naturally, she would need more than that to pay bills, most likely, but let's work with $550 for now and see what happens. That survivor annuity will be indexed for inflation, meaning it goes up every year, and she can't outlive it. You can, however, live long enough to exhaust a life insurance policy. If this same retiree had a policy of $100,000 and this widow took only $550 per month out of it, she would very quickly run out of money, in fact, in about 10 years. If we assume that she needs more money, let's say $2,200 per month or four times the survivor annuity, she would run out of money in a little over three years. So what do you actually need if you're trying to compute or rather to match the total value of the survivor benefit plan over the life of a beneficiary? Again, that varies wildly based on individual circumstance, but in this example, if the retiree before he passed wanted to match the survivor annuity at the $550 per month rate, he would need a life insurance policy of over $275,000. If he wanted to match the survivor annuity, assuming that she needs $2,200 per month, he would need a life insurance policy of over $1.1 million per month. Again, there are a lot of variables there that I'm not describing, like the ages of the retirees. In fact, they're both about 60. And it's based on the life expectancy of the beneficiary and many other factors. Um, and these numbers are very rough. I, I drew them up very quickly, so you know, don't hold that as the absolute truth. This is just a rough example to help you understand what's going on. And again, your circumstances might be quite different than what I've described. So please analyze what is true for you and make an informed decision with all that information in front of you. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of SBP that I haven't already mentioned? Obviously, this isn't a comprehensive list. I'm going to go over this very quickly for the sake of time and just hit some of the highlights. So, also, if you want some more information, you can go to the Defense Finance and Accounting Service website and get their information. They have a nice, concise list of pros and cons for SBP as well as other information. So one good advantage is this is a guaranteed source of income for your, your family and it cannot be outlived. It's indexed for inflation, which is always beneficial. Something that you won't find in life insurance policies is other than how the premiums are computed, eligibility is not based on age, for spouses anyway, and certainly not based on health conditions. So even if your wife or your husband 
has a critical illness that will not preclude eligibility for the survivor benefit plan, but it might for life insurance. Another advantage, as I mentioned earlier, you pay for SVP with pre-tax dollars. So that means you save money on the income tax side of the house. What some consider a disadvantage is the cost itself. This is a heavily subsidized cost. You're not actually paying 100% of it. And the cost comes out, as I said, pre-tax. You can try to look for life insurance policies that have a lower cost, but please keep in mind that you can outlive a life insurance policy. Another disadvantage is it's rather difficult to make changes to SVP once you've made an election. This isn't like life insurance where you can change beneficiaries or amounts anytime you wish. There are only certain times in your life when you can make those changes. I'll do another episode on when and how those changes are made. We'll just leave it there for now. Next question. What are the coverage options for survivor benefit plan? This is actually a trick question. Unlike the reserve component survivor benefit plan, there are no preset coverage options. You simply elect a beneficiary or several if you have children and the amount of your retired pay to be covered. All right, so no more trick questions. Who can be a beneficiary for SBP? As I mentioned in the last episode, I wrote a nice one-page, simple uh, fact sheet for Survivor Benefit Plan several years ago. I'm going to loosely quote from that here, add a few bits of additional information for clarity, and answer the question this way. I'm going to also put a link to that fact sheet in the show notes. If you want to download that and pass it on to other people who you think might benefit from it, you know, please go right ahead. The information, while it was written for the reserve component SBP, also applies to SBP, the active duty or 60 and over version, whatever you want to call it. So the first beneficiary that's eligible to be covered is spouse only. And to be eligible for this, your spouse must be obviously married to you before the date of your death. If you marry after retirement or you're divorced and you remarry, then that spouse must be married to you for one year before being eligible for the annuity. Now, don't take that to mean that you wait a year after marriage to make the election. You need to do it far sooner than that. But keep in mind that you have to be married for a year in order to make sure that beneficiary will get the annuity. The, the reason for that is simply to prevent deathbed marriages. All right. Next beneficiary is child or children. In this case, the premiums are based on the youngest child's age and each child will be eligible for a portion of the annuity, and when I say portion, it's divided equally between the number of eligible children. Each child will continue to receive payments until the 18th birthday, or if they're full-time students, until the 22nd birthday. And then when they're not eligible anymore, if there are multiple children, the Remaining children who are eligible will have their payments recomputed and then it will go to them. This only happens though when there's no spouse involved. So if the retiree is not married or the spouse has passed, then the eligible children are the next people who could be paid. One other status of child obviously would be children who are disabled and incapable of self-support, those children can actually be listed as beneficiaries beyond the age of 22. You do need to set a few things up, have some medical documentation to prove eligibility, and set up a trust for the benefit of that child. Another thing to consider, however, is 
survivor benefit payments might reduce payments that you're receiving from other sources for the benefit of that child, let's say state or federal uh, assistance that you might be receiving. So you want to do some research into that and see how it would affect you. I would recommend consulting with a lawyer or your local Judge Advocate General or JAG office in order to get the right information and make an informed decision. Just as a quick side note, regardless of what branch of service you might be, you're eligible to use the JAGs from any branch of service. So if you are Navy Reserve, for example, and the nearest JAG is in the Army National Guard, you're eligible to use their services. You don't have to go all the way to a, a Navy Reserve Center. You can go to the nearest JAG and make use of them. Next beneficiary type is spouse and children. This is what I was talking about a moment ago. I actually blended the two. Uh, if you have spouse and children selected, then if one, particularly the spouse, if one person is no longer eligible or no longer living, then the other person can receive the survivor annuity. The same rules apply, as I mentioned earlier, as far as eligibility. Now this next one, this next beneficiary might cause some storms out there because it is former spouse or former spouse and children. You can voluntarily elect to cover an ex-spouse or if you want to cover the children that came from that ex-spouse, from your marriage to that person, then you would need to cover both. You'd need to cover former spouse and children. This can be voluntary or it can be court ordered. If it's court ordered, then either one of you can notify DFAS of that election. If one of you doesn't do it in the required amount of time, which is one year, then the other one can do it within that same amount of time and it's equally official. If, if neither party does anything, then keep in mind that might be some conflict with your local court feds will not get involved. That's a matter between you and the court. Also, side note, for those who might be wondering, there is no federal law concerning division of retired pay in the case of a divorce. That's strictly a state matter. I'll probably do an episode on that in the future. All right, the last beneficiary type is called an insurable interest. This is kind of a fringe category. There are very few cases of people using this, primarily because it is the most expensive option. I mentioned earlier that it's possible to pay up to 40% for an SPP premium. Insurable interest is where that would happen. For a spouse, it's 6.5% for an insurable interest based on the age of that person. It could be as high as 40%. In this case, the people who are typically eligible would be dependent parents, uh, anyone else that's of a closer relation than a cousin, or cousin and closer, and in some cases a business partner or anyone who does have a vested financial interest in your survival. This is a very expensive option and most people should not choose it. You especially should not choose it if you are married or have children. If you do choose it, that person needs to live at least two years from the date of their election as a beneficiary. If, they, if you die before that time, they will not receive the survivor annuity. All right, last question on the Q&A. You know, you're convinced? You want to do this, so how do I enroll in the survivor benefit plan? It's very simple. You make that election when you apply for retired pay. And if you're in any reserve component except the Coast Guard, you would make that application for pay and the survivor election on Department of Defense or DD form 
2656 or 2656. That has a title of data for payment of retired personnel. Um, I would actually recommend you get the assistance of a, of a retirement services officer for either of these um, because it might look simple in some regards, but a lot of people mess it up. If you're in the Coast Guard Reserve, you would use a different uh, document. You would use Coast Guard Form or CG Form 4700. 4700. It is entitled Retired Pay Account Worksheet and Survivor Benefit Election. A little wordy, but essentially the same as the other. I've placed links to both of those in the show notes below. So if you wish, you can take a look at those for more information. Believe it or not, that's it for now. I hope I've made this topic of SBP a bit more understandable for you. If you do not understand everything, please try uh, watching that bit of the video again. And if that still didn't work, drop me an email or uh, post a comment in the comments section below. I'll do my utmost to explain everything to you and hopefully make things more clear. Of course, I welcome other comments you may wish to make as well. That's all for today. Thank you for joining me, and of course, thank you for your service. If you liked what you heard on today's video, then please go below and give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to this channel. Also, please let other people know about this channel and the information it can provide for them. If you have questions or comments, then please have no qualms about posting them in the comments section below. Please remember the RC Retirement YouTube channel and the rcretirement.com website are not recognized or endorsed by the Department of Defense, the Department of Veterans Affairs, or any other government agency. The information presented in these resources are for informational and entertainment purposes only. Also, the content of either of these resources should not be considered financial or legal advice. Please consult with your own legal counsel or financial planner before making any decisions based on what you have learned here. As always, thank you for watching the RC Retirement YouTube channel.